Hey everybody, welcome back to Bible Fun with the Duns. Today we're studying Luke chapter number nine. Now probably what you noticed in this story in uh, in this one chapter is this is a monster chapter, right? There's a lot of verses to it. Even for Luke. Even for Luke, that's right. And so, and because there's a lot of verses, what you'll also find is this is kind of rapid fire, a lot of different stories. And they're all tying in and they're all important. One of the things that's happening when this story starts out, this chapter begins talking about what Jesus told the disciples to do. It says, he gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach in the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so what we're starting to find out in the book of Luke is that, is that following Jesus is more than just kind of hanging around Jesus. It's becoming a disciple of Jesus. And a disciple is somebody who follows their master in, with the goal of becoming like their master. The Bible even says this. It says that a servant is not greater than his master. It is enough for a servant to be like his master. So a disciple's goal is to, is to become what his master is, to think how his master thinks, to do what his master does, and to become good at what his master is good at. They dedicate them themselves to becoming like their master. So when you read verse number one and two, and it's telling you that Jesus is giving his disciples power to heal and to teach and to preach and to do miracles, what you're figuring out is for all this time, they've been traveling the country with Jesus, watching Jesus do these things. And he pulls back and he goes, okay, now let's have a test run. You guys go do what you've been seeing me do. And so, and what it's teaching us is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to do what Jesus does. Now, listen, there's a lot of, there's a lot of miraculous power here and that's impressive, but I'm telling you what, following Jesus is a lot like thinking the way he thinks, loving the way he loves, doing what he does, follow Jesus. You may not, you may not raise the dead or heal the sick, but you can love your neighbor as yourself. All right. So we keep going through this. And the next thing we find is uh, one of my favorite stories is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now, this story starts out by, by talking about how all the people came to him. Listen, it says, but when the multitudes found out where he was, they followed him and it says, and he received them. One of my favorite little details of this story is that Jesus was so busy and often everybody wanted his attention. And you would think like, if you got busy, Sometimes you just want to kind of be left alone. You ever felt like you just wanted to be left alone? Yes. I would assume Jesus would have felt this way. And like you got 5,000 people coming at you and that's just the men. Like maybe Jesus would have gone, hey guys, it's my day off. Let me just kind of, let me rest and recharge. But no, it says he welcomed them. And what it's teaching us is that Jesus wasn't bothered or impatient with the crowds. He welcomed the crowds. And what it's teaching us is is that Jesus will always welcome us and teach us about the kingdom if we come to him asking. Now, John had a takeaway in this moment. John, lead us through. So my takeaway is about how Jesus, um, he takes the five loaves of bread and the two fish and turns it into a ton of food. And so what I got, well, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. And so it says, Then Jesus took the five loaves of bread and the two fish. He looked up to the heavens, to the heaven, and thanked God for the food. Then Jesus divided the food and gave it to all the followers to give to the people. And all the people who ate, all the people ate, were and were satisfied. And they, there was much food left. Twelve baskets were filled with pieces of food that were not eaten. So what I liked about this is how Jesus can take the hardest moments in your life and make them something great, like how he took the five loaves of bread and two fish and turned it into a ton of food. That's right. You know, I heard a long time ago, I heard the phrase, little is much when God is in it. So he can take a little and he can make a lot out of it. One of my favorite pieces to that story, John, is how when the disciples come back, they're telling Jesus that he needs to send the crowds away so that they'll find something to eat. And Jesus looks at him and he goes, well, hey, you send them some, you give them something to eat. And the disciples look at, look at things and they go, oh, nobody could do this. Well, what's, what's neat to me is these disciples had just come back from doing what Jesus told them to do, going out and preaching. 
and they did miracles and they saw people they saw people believe and they cast out demons and they did a lot. Do you think they were feeling humble or were they probably pretty proud of themselves? Pretty proud. Yeah. So in this moment, Jesus, they're telling Jesus now, now Jesus, we, we know, we know this ministry stuff now. So we need to send these people away so they can get something to eat. And Jesus, when he looks at them, he goes, Hey, you feed them. They had to look at their own lives and say, you know what? Outside of Jesus, we've got nothing to offer. I'm telling you, that's a good lesson for every Christian to learn because it keeps us humble. Outside of Jesus, we got nothing to offer. But in Jesus, there's a lot that can be given and little as much. You say, oh, it's just a little old me. Little as much when God is in it. Another piece to this chapter is the transfiguration. Jax, tell us about that. Okay, so um, of all the supernatural things that we see in this chapter, this is probably the most um, supernatural so what happens is Jesus takes his disciples, a couple of them, um, up to the top of this mountain. And there they see the ghosts of Moses and Elijah, who were these um, characters from the Old Testament. All right, stop. Were they ghosts? Uh, not really. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't there. I don't know. But I'm asking, you think it were ghosts? Um, or did they have bodies? Probably had bodies. Who knows? All right. Just a thought. All right, go ahead. All right. Anyway, um, so... The thing is, uh, when looking at this, you have to um, see what these people symbolize. So Moses, um, he's most famous for uh, bringing the law, the Ten Commandments, down from Mount Sinai. And um, so he represents the law. And Elijah was one of the most famous prophets. And so uh, the two of them kind of symbolize the whole Old Testament, the law and prophecy. And uh, they're there with Jesus and um, since the whole Old Testament points to this coming Messiah, they're there, and they're with Jesus, who is the Messiah. Okay. And another cool thing, um, back in Moses' time, in his story, he also had uh, kind of his own transfiguration. When he went up to the top of a mountain, and he saw God, and then, um, like Jesus, his face started to light up, and he started to glow. And so he received this um, heavenly power. Uh, kind of. I think he just glowed because it's like, like if I go to the beach, if I'm in the sun for five minutes, I get what? Red. So, yeah, I get a sunburn. And so he spent uh, what may have been days or hours in, in God's presence. So maybe the way my, my skin is affected by uh, the sun and gets red, when Moses had his face on, on in the presence of God, he began to glow. Right. And it usually, the Bible, the New Testament usually talks about angels glowing whenever they show up. Well, why do angels glow? Because they're with God. Because they're also in the presence of God. All right? What else? Okay. So, that's kind of cool because um, Moses was kind of like the Jesus of his time in the Old Testament. And so, here we have Jesus, but, um, so he, he doesn't receive anything he shows what he already has, and he transforms into his godly form, which is amazing. That's right. Now, I do want to jump off of what you said right there, that, that uh, Moses was kind of the Jesus of the Old Testament. That might sound kind of odd to a lot of folks, but i tell you what the Bible does say. The Bible says, as Moses is, is preparing to die, he tells the people that God is going to send somebody else like him to, to, to come into the world. Well, who was Moses? He was the one who walked with God and talked with God. He led his people out of bondage. And when we get into the New Testament, listen, Moses was not Jesus, but Jesus was the better Moses. I mean, Moses was a guy. He was sinful. Jesus is God. But he was like Moses in that on a mountain. He did meet with God. He was, he was transformed. He began to glow. But also, Jesus is the better prophet. And so Jesus fulfills that prophecy that Moses had. And what we're finding all throughout this story and all throughout this chapter is that Jesus is fulfilling all things and making all things right. And he's doing it by conquering evil, conquering sin, conquering demons. But he's also fulfilling all prophecy because every promise God ever makes to us, God keeps it. And he kept all the good ones in Jesus. Keep reading. I know there's a lot in this chapter. We can't possibly cover it all, but let's keep reading and keep studying, and uh, we'll catch chapter 10 next time. All right? Bye. Bye. Bye.